mind if I video? Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're like, stay away from the shark tools, Mom. About to go sail on the Lady Washington, which was featured in Pirates of the Caribbean and also in Star Trek, the ship that was the Enterprise. This is the Lady Washington behind me, featured in Star Trek Generations and Pirates of the Caribbean.
Alright, and on, another important command is digging a hole. If you're digging a hole, hold onto the line as tight as you can, don't let it go anywhere. Then when you hear two steps forward, walk the line, two steps forward, bring the line with you towards me. So, when I want to ask you guys if you're ready to haul on the halyard, when I say ready on the halyard, uh, when I say ready to haul, say ready on the halyard, okay? <laughs> Alright, ready on the halyard? Ready, ready on the halyard! Ready! ready. ready.
watched it, so that would really help me tell my story as fun as possible. Uh, but if you want to pay attention, feel free to do that. Um, I'm going to get started. So, once again, welcome aboard the Lady Washington. Now, you might be wondering why you are here on this physical, literal, actual boat that we are on. Now this boat, the Lady Washington that we're on today, was built in 1985. She's only about 35 years old. Now, 1980, uh, or I said 1985, didn't I? 1989, 1989 of course being the centennial celebration of the state of Washington. So Washington turns 100 years old and she goes, mom, mom, I want a boat. Uh, and so Washington says, okay, you get this boat. So the next question, of course, might be, well, why this boat then? So that is the story I'm about to tell you. Uh, so for the sake of that narrative, anytime I say this boat, I mean the original Lady Washington. So now we rewind the clock back to the date about 350 years ago when the original Lady Washington was sailing. She was built. We actually don't know. We don't know when the original Lady Washington was <laughs> built. Uh, there's a good chance she fought in the American Revolutionary War. It's a popular theory, but it turns out around 1776, naming your boat Lady Washington was really popular. Uh, there are so many Lady Washingtons from the war that we don't know which one this was in the historic record. So our story actually begins in 1787. 1787 uh, was the time the Columbia Expedition began. That's the main voyage of the Lady Washington. So tiny bit of backstory here. 1787, the United States of America is a brand new country. We have just won independence from Britain's uh, colonial rulership. We're in debt to France. We're broke. The dollar doesn't even exist yet. And most importantly, we have lost our main supply of tea. So we are tea-less, and that's a really big problem for Americans because we kind of run on the stuff. So uh, some merchants get together in Boston, Massachusetts, and they're like, all right, lads, how are we going to get the tea? Um, who's going to give us the tea? The idea they have is, well, why don't we go introduce ourselves to the Chinese? Because the Chinese are known for being excellent international trade partners, even all the way back in 1787. So let's get some boats over to China. Next question, what do the Chinese want? We're broke. We don't have any money, so we can't buy stuff from them, we need to trade things. Now it just so happens that the sea otter was just hunted to extinction off of the coasts of China. So they know about those pelts, they're extremely valuable, but they can't get them anymore. So if we can get some sea otter pelts, we might be able to get some tea from the Chinese. Sounds like a good plan. Where are the sea otters? Here. They're here. They're right here where we are today, where they are still recovering from the brink of extinction because of us. Uh, so moving on. Uh, we're gonna get those sea otter pelts here in the Northwest. We are in Boston, Massachusetts. Let me introduce the characters now. We have two boats on this expedition. The Columbia Redeviva is the larger vessel of the two. She's a three-masted bark. Think of her as like the 18-wheeler. And the smaller tender to the Columbia, the Lady Washington. That's us. Uh, if the Columbia is the 18-wheeler, we're the delivery van. Um, so we're just gonna be here, a little sidekick. And we're gonna go get some sea otter pelts and trade them for tea. It's gonna be easy. It's gonna be fun. Come on, be a sailor. Um, so we wanna get to the west coast of what will someday be Washington from Boston, Massachusetts. Boats do not travel very well over land. So does anybody know what we have to do to get there? We gotta go around the horn. That is correct. The southernmost tip of South America known as Cape Horn. We're gonna go from Boston all the way down and around. Now, if you ever heard of Cape Horn before, some of those, uh, there, there are the most extreme sailing conditions on the entire planet down there. We're talking like freezing cold conditions, gale force, 200 mile an hour winds, and sea states with waves that regularly reach 90 feet high. So if you look at the top of our main mast, that's about 89 feet up there. So the waves are going taller than this mast. And we are in this boat. This is a perfect replica, right? So we're going around the horn in the Lady Washington. And I forgot to mention, uh, as a tender at the time, she's a sloop. She's only got one mast and a fore and aft sail, so a little bit less stable. She's just getting kicked around the horn down there. So we're going around the horn and we encounter a terrible storm. And in that storm, the Columbia and the Lady Washington get separated. Now, a uh, funny part of the story I forgot to mention, the captains on these two boats, the Columbia is captained by a man named John Kendrick, and the Lady Washington is captained by a man named Robert Gray, and they hate each other. Uh, we have letters between the two. They were not happy to be working together, which I mentioned now because uh, those two boats were separated, so you can imagine how they might have felt about that. Um, Columbia ends up getting in a little bit of trouble with the Spanish down in South America, so she gets stuck there for a little bit, allowing the Lady Washington to get ahead of the game and become the first ever vessel carrying the flag of the United States to make landfall on what is now the shores of the state of Washington. So this is the first ever vessel with the U.S. flag to do that. 
eventually the Columbia did manage to catch up and John Kendrick on the big boat gets up there. You can imagine he's probably a little bit upset, right? He's like, my tender beat me to the first landfall on the West Coast. He's not very stoked about that. So, so he looks to Lady Washington and he's like, that's my boat now. Uh, and he forces Robert Gray to trade boats with him. So Kendrick is now the captain on the Lady Washington. Robert Gray goes off and does his own thing for a little while. Uh, you ever heard of the Columbia River before? First vessel to chart the mouth of the Columbia was Robert Gray, so that's why we call it that. And he also finds this place uh, called Gray's Harbor, names it after himself, becomes the first Western individual to chart those waters down there. Forget about Robert Gray. He's not who I'm talking about anymore. We're talking about the Lady Washington and John Kendrick. They, they didn't work very closely together. They were often doing separate things. So now, here we are on the shores of the Pacific Northwest, or at least that's what it will someday be called when the nations that don't exist yet will. Now, a couple other parties are already here in this region, right? We got the English have been there for a little while building forts and stuff. The Spanish are already there. They've been building forts and stuff. They keep fighting with the English. They really don't like each other. And of course, the First Nations and Indigenous peoples have been here since time in memoriam, and as a matter of fact, are still here today. Great time to mention that we are currently on the ancestral lands of the Puyallup peoples here in Tacoma. That is their reservation land right over there. So this is a part of the story where I like to mention that we have a little bit of a responsibility to be aware of the reality of our relationship with the First Nations and Indigenous peoples in the United States of America today, right? This is a legacy that evolved into one of displaced Indigenous peoples and not honored treaties. Uh, that is a really important part of the history to be aware of. Uh, it's also not necessarily my story to tell, so I also like to take just a moment to encourage you to look into some sources of some of the native stories about this region. There's one example I don't have out because it's raining right now and I don't want it to get wet, but it's called Raven's Cry by Christy Harris. Uh, you can ask any of the crew about the name of that book again. It's a great example of some of those resources. Raven's Cry by Christy Harris. I mention that one specifically because in it, there's actually a story that survives from the oral tradition of the Haida people about an encounter with the Lady Washington and Captain John Kendrick. It's a story that they told to each other for 350 years that survives today about this boat arriving to this part of the world, and it's a really important thing to be aware of. At the time, however, Western powers were just arriving to the west coast of the Pacific Ocean, and they were entirely dependent on the native people for the trade goods that they needed, and in fact, their very survival, right? We needed to know where the clean drinking water was, how do we catch game, how do we get the things that we need? So that's a, another funny part of the story, right? The Boston men, as they were called by the native peoples of this region, they arrive and they're like, okay, Time to get some sea otter pelts. Good thing they grow on trees. They must have been thinking when they, for all the preparation they did to get the stuff they needed. Uh, Cause they get here and there's stories about them going out in their longboats to hunt the sea otters and the sea otters are like, ah, bye. And just going underwater. And they're like, how do you catch these things? They can't do it. Uh, so they have to trade with the first nations and indigenous peoples in order to get those sea otter pelts that they needed. And so they did that. Uh, very simplified version of that story, but we've got more to tell. So we end up with a hold full of sea otter pelts here in the West Coast. Keep in mind, it's been like almost two years that we've been doing this since we left Boston, Massachusetts, right? We've all been living on this boat together for a pretty long time. Uh, what were we doing again? Sea otters. So yeah, we got the sea otters. Why did I get all these sea otter pelts? Oh, the tea. That's right, the tea, thank you. Okay, so we need to go get the tea. Where's the tea? It's in China. So we're gonna sail all the way across the Western Pacific Ocean to get to China from the shores of Washington and Southern British Columbia. Quick little pit stop along the way. There's a small group of islands in the middle of the Pacific you might have heard of. Today we call them the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, there's a guy there, his name's King Kamehameha. He wants to unite Hawaiian peoples through diplomacy and conquest. And he wants to use Western naval technology to help him do that. Turns out he's also got sandalwood and black pearls. Good deal. So John Kendrick leaves a couple of guys on Hawaii to trade that knowledge for those goods. Hopefully we remember to come back for them later. Let's see if we have time in the story for that part. But we got somewhere to be. So back on our way to China. We go to China. We get to China. It took longer than that, uh, but we finally arrived. Now there's another important thing happening in China I have to mention. You might have heard of the Opium Wars. So. The powers of British English, uh, the Dutch East India Company, all those sorts of uh, bodies are deliberately pumping opium into the Chinese economy to destabilize it and gain greater control over that region. So when an American shows up, the first question the people are asking is, what is an American? Uh, it's the first time the US flag had ever arrived on the shores of China was John Kendrick on the Lady Washington, this boat. So we show up and we have to cut through some of the bureaucracy for a little while. We get stuck there for a little bit. 
Uh, and it's during that time that John Kendrick makes a very important decision, and that is to sell the Lady Washington to himself <laughs> for free, for nothing. He writes a bill of sale for zero anything and says, I own the Lady Washington now because I'm in China and my bosses are in Boston, Massachusetts. So, nah. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was illegal, but you know, what are you going to do? He's in China. So he sells the boat to himself, decides he owns it, decides he's going to be the master of this whole expedition, makes another important decision. I mentioned earlier that this whole time the Lady Washington has been a sloop, that is a single-masted sailing vessel with one large fore and aft rigged mainsail. They're a little speedier, they're a little more maneuverable when they're close to the shore, but they're not very good for crossing oceans. So John Kendrick refits her as a brig, which is what we are now. A little better for crossing oceans, that's what we see in our modern replica today. So, we got our brig, we sold our sea otter pelts, we got our tea, we made a little bit of money, we sold the boat to ourselves, and that's when John Kendrick decides, you know what? I'm not gonna go back to Boston, Massachusetts. This is too cool. I'm gonna go start my own little trade empire on the West Coast. Um, we don't know exactly what he was planning to do. We don't have a record of him writing like, Dear Diary, today I will betray the United States of America. Uh, but he did take off and he clearly never had plans to come back. So he starts his little uh, opportunity running back and forth across the Pacific Ocean. And I think that's really cool to talk about when we're here in Tacoma because that route, right, from China to Washington is virtually the same one that is being run today, right? When we're here looking at the port of Tacoma, we get container ships coming from places like Singapore, Hong Kong, just like that, coming across basically the same route that the Lady Washington was running back in the 1780s. So uh, we got all those containers over there. This is about uh, approximately one of those containers worth of hold space. So we can move a lot more of them now, but this is how it all started. So the Lady Washington ran that trade route till about 1792, 1793, when she founders in the Philippines. That means sinks in a storm. So that's the end of the Lady Washington story. But since I still clearly have your attention, I'll tell you my favorite part of the whole story, actually. It's that little bonus bit at the end about John Kendrick and how he meets the end of his maritime career as an individual. So you remember those guys we left back on Hawaii? We didn't forget about them. We want those pearls, we want those sandalwoods. Uh, so we're gonna go back and we're gonna pick those guys up. And King Kamehameha's there, and he's like, hey, man, you want to help me uh, fight in these campaigns to unify the people? And John Kendrick's like, yeah, sure, I love fighting things on my boat. So they engage in that campaign alongside an English vessel named the Jackal. So after all the fighting is done, uh, the campaign is successful. Hawaii becomes unified under King Kamehameha. Uh, and afterwards, it's all done. The Jackal, never mind that they're an English ship, that's not important, uh, decides they're going to give the Lady Washington a three-gun salute for their cooperation in the battle. Of course, a three-gun salute being blank shots fired from the ship's cannons as a sign of respect. And so we know John Kendrick was standing back there in the aft cabin on the Lady Washington, and the first gun goes off. It probably sounds really cool, right? You can imagine like a blank cannon, like, man, I'm really cool right now. The second gun goes off, it's a blank shot. Uh, you might have guessed where this is going. The third gun was loaded. Uh, we can't prove why. We don't know anything. They said it was an accident. Um, but that third gun was loaded, and we do know from letters written by the crew that John Kendrick was standing in the aft cabin of the Lady Washington when he was directly hit with a four-pound cannonball. Oh. So, he's <laughs> probably feeling pretty good about himself, but he's not feeling anything at all. Uh, that's, that's, that's about the best way to go and see I could possibly imagine. So, uh, that's John Kendrick's early retirement in the Hawaiian Islands. Nice place, I hear. And uh, after they finished scrubbing him off the walls, the Lady Washington did continue to sail as a cargo ship on that same route for a number of years under a new captain whose name I haven't actually memorized yet because he didn't do anything famous and he didn't explode. So, uh, <laughs> like I said, 1792, the end of the Lady Washington's life was a big storm down in the Philippines, the ship sank, and one last really remarkable thing happened, and that is nearly the entire crew survived. So that's very uncommon in the 18th century for almost everybody to live, and they made it off with their personal diaries, their log books, the trade ledgers, drawings they made of the ship. You know, sailors love to make little models and drawings and stuff. They're obsessed with their boats, little weirdos. Um, so because so many of them survived that sinking, we had enough information to create this near perfect replica of the Lady Washington that we are on today and which we rebuilt for the centennial of Washington on account of it being the first boat with the flag of the United States that ever landed here. So. We fast forward all the way back to 2024 in the future. I try not to think too hard about that part. It freaks me out a little bit, but we're here nonetheless. This boat is owned and operated by the Grays Harbor Historical Seaport. Those are the folks that write me my paycheck. They are a non-profit organization based in Aberdeen, Washington. We focus mainly on three things, and that is education, sail training, and recreational day sales. So a lot of what we've been doing here in Tacoma is actually partnering with the public school groups through the Foss Waterway here. Uh, we served 
a really significant number of the public school kids here out of Tacoma, out board, doing field trips and stuff like that, hands-on lines, edge stations, really cool stuff. Oh, we also do sail training. It's a big part of our bread and butter. So we have a program called Two Weeks Before the Mast. And any single one of you, once you turn 16 years old, can come on board for two weeks. You live on the boat with us, you eat with us, you hang out with us, you put up with my jokes for two weeks straight. I love you, Alec. Uh, <laughs> and we will teach you how to be a tall ship sailor in that time. So if you're interested in that, that's uh, all on our website, really cool stuff. And of course, our recreational day sails, which hopefully need no explanation because it's what we are doing right now. So once again, uh, actually before I sign off, let me mention again, uh, if you have any questions after this, Please ask the crew, bother us. We love to talk about this kind of stuff. So keep that in mind, don't be shy. And with that being said, my name's Evelyn. Thank you very much for listening. Bye.